very much economics have determined that people generally have not, in the past, very much built or owned their own. But there have been exceptions to that. Um, there are some purists, mostly people from overseas, that um, think that the New Zealand sound system scene is not proper or authentic, but uh, like I said, they're usually not from here. And uh, regardless of the ownership or the building of the PA equipment itself, the, the passion behind people who play reggae records in this country and their desire to get that new music into the ears of as many people as possible is exactly the same. Um, I want to talk about a personal experience now. The first time in my life that I ever witnessed an actual proper sound system was in 1984. Um, I attended a dance put on by the 12 tribes of Israel uh, at the Ponsonby Community Centre. I think uh, Tingy and Midiyama would have both been present at that one. Um, there was a band playing called the Dread Lion Band, and the sound system at the time was called the Jalat Music Sound System. Um, this was a this was really, a, I would say, a turning point for me, uh, seeing an actual proper sound system um, with an MC, a Jamaican man by the name of Hensley Dyer uh, was the MC, and I knew about. DJ music, or sorry, uh, reggae MCs, because by then I already owned records by, by U Roy and, and Yellow Man and, and Eka Mouse and Josie Whale and these guys. So I knew about MC music, but this was the first time I had actually seen a person in the flesh on the mic toasting over rhythms. Um, and uh, yeah, and it had a big effect on me. And also the spirit of this dance. I mean, the, the Ponsonby Community Centre was essentially a church hall. and um, it wasn't just people that were there to hear good reggae music. There was a real spiritual element about what was going on. It was very inclusive. Everyone was welcome. Um, but there was a real spiritual vibe, not only about the music that was being played, but about the people that were there. And I think this was the first time I had been around people in New Zealand. And I was like, oh, these are the Rastafarians. You know, these, these are the real Rastafarians here. And the music and... Like I said, the fact that they had an actual sound system and were doing rewinds and toasting and the band was fantastic. And um, that kind of started a long association for me. I just, uh, after, after that first dance, I just kept going back for, for years and years and years. And um, whenever I could, if I found out the 12 Tribes of Israel were having a dance, I'd go back. And um, uh, years later, I, I ended up, well, in fact, in 1989, I started a partnership with Hensley's son, um, Hope who goes by the name of Tuffy Culture, and him and I performed together solidly from 89 right through till about 2003 as a, a kind of a duo act, DJ and MC. Um, and uh, later on, it was a great honour for me to be invited by the 12 Tribes of Israel to DJ at some of their dances as a guest selector, um, and uh, that really was a great honour for me. Um, but I must say, yes, it, it, what that particular night in 1984 showed me was that there was room in this country for sound system culture and that there also were people who were interested in Rasta music in particular, you know, because I'm first and foremost a reggae fan, but there's a conscious element to reggae music, which is, I guess, what makes it different from any other type of music. Um, I want to quickly mention the role of uh, radio here um, and especially the student radio network um, who've had a huge role in disseminating reggae music uh, and also therefore Rasta philosophy in this country. Um, back in the 80s, uh, imported reggae records were really scarce. The shops that did bring titles in would usually only order one of something. So if you didn't get to the shop first, then you missed out on a copy of that record. Um, so often for people like myself who liked reggae in the 80s, the first port of call was... Uh, campus radio and uh, radio shows like, like Duncan Campbell hosted Campus Radio Sound System, which uh, was on BFU <coughs> from 1980 to 1990. Um, reggae fans would record these radio shows um, and then they would record off those tapes. So you could do tapes of tapes to give to your friends going, wow, this guy played a great new tune. And it was a way for us before the internet and before good reggae records were widely available here. That was how we heard new music or new reggae music and new styles and it was very, very important and I just mentioned that because, you know, before Iwi stations had the reach 
and the clout that they have now, and before people sort of imported um, American urban radio formats, which are also huge nowadays, it was actually <coughs> the student radio stations that played any kind of music that was underground or interesting, and, and especially black music like funk, reggae, hip hop, and early dance music, um, house, techno, jungle, drum and bass, etc. The only place you could hear that music was on student radio stations. So. They had a huge role to play in sort of getting it out there. Um, as part of my show, I always, um, because I played a lot of conscious reggae, I always tried to include guest selectors and of those people like Obelix Brown and um, Sergeant Benji from the 12 Tribes of Israel. And I thought it was very useful because it meant that they could explain certain religious significance of, of a certain artist or a certain piece of music that, that we were playing up there. Um, and it just helped me out. It was like calling in an expert, if you like, you know, but uh, there was always the link between Rasta and the reggae music I was playing on the radio. Um, now, New Zealand DJs, even, even though they didn't own their own PAs, um, still adopted the sort of collective formation that the overseas sound systems had. So you had a lot of crews forming um, in Wellington, people like Roots Foundation and Dancehall Don. Um, in Auckland, 12 Tribes of Israel sound system, Styli Crew, Bass Stepper sound system, people like that. And they would put on their own dances, regular reggae nights, and, and sometimes in unusual venues. Um, theatres, you know, car parks, not always music venues, but wherever they could put it. Um, and uh, this was a, a totally an independent and cooperative effort. So these people were working together, they hired equipment, they would determine which DJs, MCs or bands were going to play. They would do the posters, they put the posters up. They'd usually charge gold coin at the door and um, it was very much driven by the DJs and the selectors, not like some promoter who's putting on a dance party you know, and then paying the DJs. It was the DJs, these sound system people who were running the dances um, in that format. Um, just to finish off, these days I think the, the sound system scene in New Zealand is um, it's growing. Uh, what we do have now is a, a number of passionate owner-operators who are building their own rigs. Um, down here in Wellington, Vital Sounds Hi-Fi and Mayhem. Um, up in Auckland, Jaffa Mafia, Backyard Sound System and a new one based in Piha called Lion Rockers Hi-Fi. Um, new Zealand selectors are buying dub plates from artists overseas, so you, see, you get to hear a lot more dub plates nowadays than you used to. Um, and the scene is, is getting larger and more lively than it ever was. Um, you still have old selectors like myself, um, Danny Lemon, Obelix Brown, and these guys who've, who've sort of been in the game for 25 or 30 years, but you now have a whole new generation of reggae selectors coming through as well, which actually means there's more people out there playing reggae than there ever was before. Um, and the music is much easier to get. Uh, of course, the internet has opened things right up. DJs are often using CDs in MP3 file format now. Um, you can find stuff on the internet. You can get it sent really quickly. So uh, it's, it's become a lot more immediate. We can jump on a new tune within a week of it coming out in Jamaica. Um, it's interesting, just quickly on the subject of MP3s, um, in Jamaica now, all the sound systems operate off CDs. Pretty much all of them, um, but in Europe there seems to be a movement to going back to vinyl because they like the traditional idea. They like they like the wooden speakers. They like the old-fashioned style. So a lot of the European reggae producers are still pressing their stuff on vinyl, and a lot of the European sound systems, let's say in Germany or the UK, play off vinyl. But nonetheless, I think CDs and MP3s have really sped things up. A producer finishes a track now, he can email it directly to the selector. That selector can play it that night on his sound system. It's, it's that quick. Um, that is about all I have to say about the development of, uh, of our own. But uh, I've got to say, it's been, it's been a, long, a long, slow road, but it has gone from small and it has grown all the time. And it's never, it's never fallen off, you know, despite, say, the popularity of uh, house music or... Nowadays, hip-hop is very large in the cultural landscape. Reggae in this country has just grown and grown and grown, and I don't see it um, dying off at all anytime soon. Mm. Thanks very much for your time, and um, I'm going to stick around up here because I think we're going to cross to uh, question time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you.